So I'm here to talk about Python and web dev. And if you're here at DjangoCon, then you're already familiar with Django, of course. But there's lots of other Python web dev frameworks out there. So Django is actually influenced by several earlier frameworks, like Zope and Plone. And in turn, it has inspired lots of other frameworks that came after it, like Pyramid, TurboGears, CherryPy, Bottle, and Web2Py. But the one that I'm here to talk about is called Flask. Now, Flask is a micro framework that has some surprising beginnings. It actually started as an April Fool's joke, if you can believe it. Uh, the author of this framework had written two other frameworks called Verkzug, which is like a server framework, and Jinja2, which is a templating library. And he figured it would be kind of fun to take these two libraries, put them to together into a zip file, and then write this denied framework that when you ran it, it would just automatically unzip these libraries onto your computer and run them and thought everyone would just laugh. And instead, everyone said, this is fantastic. We need to actually use this in production. <laughs> so he turned it into an actual production-ready framework that has actually gotten surprisingly popular. If you look on GitHub today, you will see that if you list all of the Python repositories, Django and Flask are both up there. And Flask actually has more stars than Django does. So if that's your measure of popularity, then Flask is more popular. So you might be asking yourself, why is Flask so popular? Is it actually better than Django? And the answer, as you might imagine, is it depends. Django is large. Flask is small. Both of them are good. You know, we're a friendly community, and we love each other. <laughs> so let me give you some examples to introduce what Flask is and how to use it. I'm assuming that you have some, familiar, some familiarity with Django but that you know little to nothing about, about Flask. So where do we start with programming? We always start with Hello World. Here is the Hello World application in Flask. As you can see, it is literally five lines of code. And you run it by calling Flask run and setting an environment variable to let the Flask command line script know where to find your application. So in this case, I've taken these five lines of code and put it in a file called hello.py. So I just say Flask app equals hello.py, Flask run. And that will start a local development server on port 5000. And if you visit the root of that website, you'll see the string hello world in your browser. It is really that easy. Uh, by contrast, if you want to do hello world in Django, you start by installing Django, and then you do Django admin start project project. You go into your project, you make your hello app, which then, of course, you have to put that into the settings.py. Then you write your hello view, which requires importing this HTTP response thing and returning it. And then you have to deal with urls.py, which means writing regular expressions, which is always a pain, especially for someone who is new to programming and doesn't necessarily know how to do regular expressions. So I've actually found when talking with people who are new to web development in Python that Django is more intimidating to beginners than Flask is. Django has a steeper learning curve because you have to go over settings and regular expressions. You have to understand the concepts of projects versus applications. Flask is much simpler to get started. You can actually have your entire project in a single file, and that works really well. So by that account, Flask wins out with the simplicity factor for getting started. But projects are generally more complicated than Hello World. Typically, you want to store some data in a database, modify it, and render that data on the, on the, on the front end. So how do you do data modeling? Well, let's start with Django this time. Well, in Django, we're going to use the Django ORM. So you do from Django DB import models. And here I'm defining a very basic blog post model. This is code that you've probably seen before. Uh, to manipulate the data, you just create an instance of it, assign information on properties, and do uh, object.save. And then you can query the database by doing blogpost.objects. And you can do filters, and you can do selects, and all sorts of standard things that you can do with database querying. So how do you do the same sort of thing in Flask? Well, the answer is you don't. So Flask actually doesn't have data models. Now you're looking at this and you're wondering, how can that be? How can a web framework not have a data model? How can a web framework that's apparently more popular than Django not have a data model? Well, the answer is that, J is that Flask has a very different perspective and ideology from Django. Django bundles everything all together, and Flask is much more modular. So here's an example of how you might handle data modeling in Django versus Flask. You can see that the Django ORM is built into Django itself. So you install Django, and you've got it. 
Flask doesn't have that, but Flask has connections to other Python modules in the Python package index that will do data modeling for you. For example, the SQL Alchemy ORM is a very popular one. If you want to do non-relational databases with MongoDB, you can use Mongo Engine. There's a smaller framework called Peewee that's been getting some attention lately. So the idea is that Flask is very, very minimalist. It has almost nothing in there. It has only the bare necessities for what you need in order to do a simple static website, essentially. It includes templating, URL routing, error handling, and a debugger. That is all. However, it is designed to be incredibly extensible so that you can plug and play and choose which components that you want to plug into your website and make it work exactly the way that you want. So let me give you an example that shows you how you might do data modeling using SQL Alchemy and Flask. So there's an extension called Flask SQL Alchemy, which is designed to cleanly integrate these two different modules. So you would just install that, and that installs SQL Alchemy itself as a dependency. And then you do some basic setup to configure it. So I'm going to import that extension, and I'm going to configure it onto my Flask application. And as you can see, the Flask application also has this .config object where you can set information that your application or extensions can read and use. So in this case, I might say that I want my, my database to be a SQLite database that uses the test.db file under the temp directory, whatever. The thing that's really important here is that you notice that you're importing the SQL Alchemy class and you're creating a variable called db that you, you get by wrapping your application with SQL Alchemy. So now that you have this db object, you can do some very familiar things with it. So here I'm defining a data model, a blog post data model, and you can see that it looks very familiar to the same sort of thing that you would do with the Django ORM. In fact, I'll take the previous example and I'll put it on the same slide so that you can compare and contrast. They're not identical, but they're very similar to each other. And if you've used the Django ORM, you can use SQL Alchemy in almost the same way. You can also manipulate data in very similar fashions. So you can create an instance of a blog post, uh, an instance of a blog post class, assign information to it, and then instead of calling .save on it, you have to add it to the database session and commit the session. It's the same basic concept. SQL Alchemy is just making you sort of be a little bit more explicit with how this database interaction works. And you can query data in the same way. So you do .query instead of .objects, and you can do .filter or .filter by, and there's a lot of the same basic things that you can do in Django, and you can do the same sort of thing in SQL Alchemy. In fact, I'm of the opinion that SQL Alchemy is a more powerful object relational mapper than Django ORM, but that's another topic for another time. So, <laughs> so by comparison, so to talk about data models here on a higher level, Django's data models are easier to get started because they're built in. So you don't need to import and install anything else to get started. However, Flask allows you more flexibility to choose whatever you want to use. Django assumes that you're going to use a relational database. Flask, you can use whatever you want. You can use Mongo. You can use Google App Engine's data store. You can use whatever. It doesn't matter. But of course, the more options you have, the more flexibility you have, the more chance you have to screw something up. So you know, it's a trade-off there. Let's keep going. Most web applications have users, and they also have an admin to be able to view information in your database and modify it. So how do these compare? Can you do this sort of thing with Flask? Well, with Django, we have your familiar django.contrib.auth. It's built in. It's easy. I'm sure you're all rather familiar with it. If you, need extra model, if you need extra information for your users, you can swap out the user model. It's a little complicated. You can also make a user profile to attach to it. That's also a little complicated, but it works pretty well. With the admin, you have django.contrib.admin, also built in and easy, very customizable, and there's a lot of documentation out there with a fine-grained permission system so that different admin users can get access to different objects to administer. So how do we do it in Flask? Well, as you might imagine, you don't have users built in because you don't even have a data model built in. But there is a very popular Flask extension called Flask Login, which is generic and works with just about any data model, including SQL Alchemy, if you'd like. So here's an example of how we might do that. I'm going to define a user class, 
And you can see I'm importing this user mixin from, from Flask login that gives it a couple of extra little superpowers so that we have some standard usage that you can use across your framework re regardless of whether you're using SQL Alchemy or Mongo or whatever. So for example, in my route, I might say if current user dot is anonymous. Now current user is something that's provided by Flask login. It's a pointer basically to whatever user is currently logged in. And the is anonymous thing is provided by that user mixin that I showed you earlier. So here's a simple view where I'm saying, if you're anonymous, just render the slash page. Otherwise, show the user homepage. Uh, Flask login will also give you a login required decorator, which you've probably seen from Django as well. So it's just a decorator that you apply to your view. If the user tries to access the view and they're not logged in, they'll get a 403 forbidden exception. Again, very similar to Django, but the idea is that you build this piece by piece. With user permissions, you can also use the Flask principle extension that has a very similar fine-grained permissioning system the same way that Django, Django, user, Django contrib auth models do. So the idea is if you don't want a permissioning system, you don't need to have it. Django users have that built in by default and you have to sort of deal with it whether you want it or not. With Flask, you can decide if you want to add that in or not. And with the admin, as you might expect, there's a Flask admin extension as well. So you want to use that, you install it, you set it up, and you decide which theme you want to use. It has a couple of themes built in based on Bootstrap, or you can write your own. It works with several different database backends, including SQL Alchemy and Mongo and Peewee, and it's designed to work with or without any sort of other any user extension that you want. So it's very common to have it work with Flask login and Flask, prin Flask principle, but it's not required. Here's some screenshots of how it looks. Here's the list view so you can see all of your users. Here's how you edit a user. As you can see, it's all standard Bootstrap. So it's pretty familiar and it's pretty powerful. Now there's a lot of different extensions that I've just gone over and having a user and admin system is pretty standard. So there's actually an extension called Flask Security, which all it does is it takes about five or six different Flask extensions and bundles them all together into one package so that they're already designed to hook up together properly. So you can just install this one extension and bam, you've got your users, your permissions, your admin, it's all there, it's great. And of course, it works with SQL Alchemy, Mongo Engine, or Peewee. So you've got a lot of flexibility here. So again, Django has a user, a user framework and admin built in, and they work very well. Uh, they're, not, maybe, they're not as flexible as personally I would like, but for a lot of people, they work great. Flask requires a lot of different extensions working together in concert, which makes for a steeper learning curve. But it means that you can define your user model and your permissioning system to work exactly the way that you want. So it's basically a question of do you want off the shelf or do you want extensive customization? There's also the idea of reusable apps. So Django has got this nailed with the whole Django apps system that you have to have an app every time you create your project. Uh, all code related to one concept lives in one place. Like for example, you might have all the registration logic in one place. How does that compare? So with Django, you install your thing and you get it set up in the installed apps list in the settings. Uh, you have the Django Packages website available, which is fantastic and shows you a lot of good information about the packages available, but it's a little hard to figure out which packages you actually want, which ones are maintained, which ones are high quality, and so on. And of course, if you're writing your own application, it's very tempting to just stick everything into one app rather than organizing it into several. It's sort of complicated to figure out how you want to move all of those pieces around. By contrast, Blue Flask has something called Blueprints, which are not quite the same thing, but they're pretty similar. It's a way of organizing the views in your application so that you can, again, group logic together into similar places. But it doesn't require that you move models into different places. It doesn't require anything about migrations in different places. It's basically just views. So it's, it's much smaller and much more lightweight, which might be a good thing or a bad thing depending on how, on how you look at it. It's also a very familiar syntax. So let me go back to our basic hello world that we had before. And I will take this application and I'll transform it into a blueprint just like this. You can see the only things I had to change was turn the app variable into a blueprint variable. And I can still do the same basic route decorator on top. And now once I have this hello underscore BP blueprint, I can attach it to an existing application just by importing it from the file where I have it defined. And I can call app.register blueprint of the blueprint that I've defined. So it makes it much easier to take an application that was originally defined as one monolithic application and separate it out into several different blueprints. 
although you might do the same sort of thing with Django apps. So to compare, Django apps are more comprehensive. There's a lot more of them out there, especially if you check the Django Packages website. But they're also more complex. And sometimes it's hard to refactor your own application into Django apps. By contrast, Flask blueprints are simpler and they're easier to integrate with a project, but maybe they don't provide the power that you're looking for. Again, it's, it's sort of a subjective thing. Another thing that a lot of websites need is APIs. They're increasingly common for web, app, for web applications, and they have different user patterns compared to HTML web pages. So how do these two compare? Well, when you're dealing with Django, you want to use Django REST framework. It's great. I'm sure you've all heard tons and tons of praise from this framework over the past few days. It's multi-layered abstract, multi abstraction, so you can choose which layer you want to go with. It has tons of documentation, and it works great. So what about with Flask? Well, as you might imagine, you want to use multiple different extensions working together to provide the experience that you're looking for. Uh, with Django REST framework, typically the thing that sort of forms the core of how your API is structured is the serializer. And in Flask, you would probably want to use the Marshmallow module, which is, as you might imagine, a serializer framework. And the ecosystem has integrations with Flask, with SQL Alchemy, with Mongo Engine, with a whole bunch of other things. So no matter what sort of structure you've decided for your web app, Flask, uh, Marshmallow will work properly with it. So let me give you an example. This is a fair amount of code, but this is uh, an application written in Flask that returns a JSON-based API endpoint to return information about the currently logged in user. Now, I'll annotate this a little bit. You can see at the start, I am importing a whole bunch of stuff, and then I'm going to initialize the Flask Marshmallow extension and save it into a variable called MA. Then I'm going to define my schema, which is basically the serializer. Uh, Django REST framework uses the word serializer. Marshmallow uses the word schema. It's the same basic thing. And you can see I'm telling it to just find the fields defined on the user model and exclude the password field because we don't want that being displayed on our API. And then in the actual API view, I can just say initialize this user schema and take the current user and output it as JSON. And I also have the login required decorator that I talked about earlier, which will make sure that you can only access this API endpoint if you are currently logged in. So this is one page, you know, this is maybe 15 lines of code, and we have a basic API set up in such a way that you can understand every single piece of the puzzle of how it's put together. So Django versus Flask when it comes to APIs, Django REST framework is amazing. I really wish that Flask had something that was as well put together and as clean and as abstracted as Django REST framework. We don't have that yet. Maybe someone will put that together the same way that people did that for Flask security. But as it is, you can still use all the extensions that you want to put together something just as powerful as DRF, if not more so. And you have more flexibility as well because you're not constrained to the constraints that Django puts upon you. You can use a non-relational database if you want to. You can use any sort of different components that you want to mix into your application to make it taste exactly the way that you want. So the question you might be asking yourself is, which one do I choose? And of course, it's up to you. It depends on the project. But let me give you a couple of brief bullet points so that you have an idea of which to go for. You generally want to choose Django when you're happy with all the choices that Django makes for you. So I've been talking about how Django restricts you to using a relational database. Maybe you like using a relational database. If that's the case, go for it. Uh, Django makes you use Django templates, although that's changed recently. You can swap out different templating systems. But generally, you want to go with the things that Django provides for you. The more that you do that, the happier you'll be. If you're not doing anything too unusual, Django will work great for you. Because the more that you try to fight the framework, the more pain you'll experience. And also, Django sort of sets up a whole bunch of different things for you. You can, you can peek under the covers, and you can learn how the ORM works, and how the templating system works, and how all the different pieces fit together. But you don't necessarily have to. By contrast, you might want to choose Flask when you disagree with one of Django's choices, and you want to do things differently. If you want to use SQL Alchemy instead of the Django ORM, for example. Or if you have unusual requirements, like using a non-relational database, or doing something else that seems a little bit odd or unusual for a web framework. Django will fight you a little bit on this. Flask will say, yeah, do what you want, great. Or it's great to use Flask when you're doing a hobbyist side project, and maybe you're less concerned with having a working project and more concerned with understanding all the different layers and how they work together. 
It's great for really making you learn how all the pieces fit together, and it'll make you a better programmer by having that understanding. So I'm about out of time, but that's all I have to say. Does anyone have any questions? I only have a little bit of time to take questions, and I will also say I'm sure there are people here with a lot of opinions, so I'm going to be out in the lobby to host an argument session after this talk. <laughs>